I want to spend a moment to talk about something I've only featured once on this channel. Despite the focus on other athletic feats, it's an important weekend on the golf calendar. The US Open is taking place. One of the major tourneys of the year where every golfer wants to play their best. Hosted at some of the most challenging courses in the country, it will test a man's mettle and endurance all at once. However, nobody's talking about the Open this year. It's about something else. Tensions are rising. Golf is at the most critical situation it's faced since the game was invented. A cold war is bubbling to the surface. A conflict that puts golfer against golfer, fan against fan, and creates the greatest ethical dilemma in the sport's history. A long-standing pillar of the golf world is something it has never experienced in its history. Competition. But not just any sort of competition, but from a group with pockets as deep as the Grand Canyon. Let's get a little backstory first. Everyone knows about the PGA Tour. The Professional Golfers Association has been the standard for golf in the United States for roughly the history of organized professional golf. The legends that have played in this hallowed organization need no introduction. Sneed, Palmer, Player, Nicholas, Watson, Tiger Woods. It's made names and broken their hearts at the same time. Golf is unforgiving, and golf is a staple of time itself. Just a few years ago, nobody thought there would ever be competition for the PGA. The cost of entry for a league is way too high and the best playing talent is already secured. It would have to take a group with an endless reserve of funding to come close to competing with such an entity. That was true. Until now. A new suitor is under the fray offering golfers riches beyond their wildest dreams. Its name is Live Golf. Once thought to be a pipe dream with little chance of gaining traction, it's become very real. An eight-course tournament offering rewards seismic in scale. A prize pool of $255 million. Three days of golf per course instead of four. No player cuts. Winning golfers earning the richest sums given out in the history of the sport. Team play with designated captains that draft players. Bonuses for top performing teams at the end of tournaments. The league itself is run by Greg Norman. The goddamn shark. Name brand recognition with the cash worthy of the best in the world. I know what everyone's thinking. This is too good to be true. What's the catch? You know how timeshares get you with HOAs and maintenance fees? Well, imagine that, but its leaders will kill you if you look at them incorrectly. If you haven't guessed by now, Liv is funded by Saudi Arabia. Whenever the Saudis enter the fray, eyes begin to twitch and lips show a scowl. I mean, when you look at their illustrious history of human rights abuses, persecution of gays and women, and execution of those critical of the ruling class, it's not hard to see why. Their lack of transparency in operations and financial dealings don't mesh with the economic values of the Western world. That's also not getting into their... let's call them allegations of funding terrorist groups throughout the world in the past. Now that's a myth, they say. What is in it's their love of sport? and their desire to spread the influence of Saudi might around the world. Under their public investment fund, Saudi Arabia can do just that with a near infinite amount of oil money. This past year, they finally finalized a deal to buy Newcastle FC of the Premier League. After months of criticism and scrutiny, the country secured a Formula One event where they're paying $65 million per Grand Prix. To deal with their blistering temperatures, they race at night. WWE has a 10-year deal to host events in the country. Mainly the Crown Jewel, where past prime wrestlers and women since 2019 come to entertain thousands of fans for a shitload of cash. They threw $300 million at the Asian door for them to recognize Liv Golf. Horse racing, tennis, chess, they have it all. With Liv, this is the country's next quest to diversify their economy, to become a center of culture and entertainment, to wash away their terrible reputation through sports. They say things are different and changing in that country, but are they really? That's the question for golfers to consider. The money is incredibly tempting. Put yourself in the shoes of a golfer. You travel across America and sometimes the world to play in events that are hyper-competitive against over a hundred of the world's best golfers. And the risk of being cut with a poor round or two is very real. In most tourneys, if you miss the 36-hole cut, you make nothing. If it happens to be in a major tournament, you'll make a couple thousand dollars, but there's still the potential of losing your PGA Tour card if you don't perform well enough. Take that in comparison to Liv. There are no cuts, a limited number of golfers, and the minimum one can make if they finish in dead last is $120,000. In most PGA tournaments, you aren't making that unless you finish higher than 20th. 
In Liv's inaugural tourney, Charles Schwartzel won not only on the golf course, but in his bank account. Winning netted him a $4 million prize. In the PGA, Schwartzel never earned more than $3 million in a single year. That's also not considering that his assigned team ended up winning the team tournament that weekend. So he earned an extra $750,000 on top of that. Currently, there are only nine golfers on the PGA Tour that have earned more in 2022. Schwartzel reached that total in three days. Is it any wonder why there are so many great players defecting for it? We're not just talking guys on the fringes of the tour, think major champions. Dustin Johnson, Sergio Garcia, Lee Westwood, Bryson DeChambeau, Louis Oosthuizen, Ricky Fowler, Phil Mickelson. Liv had offered a physically wrecked Tiger Woods a nine-figure sum just to simply play golf for them. Before they got Greg Norman, Liv threw over $100 million at Jack Nicklaus to run the league. Dustin Johnson and Phil Mickelson are getting nine figures just to play in the tourneys, not counting the prizes. If you're a leader of the PGA, you're starting to panic. You have money, but nowhere near enough to compete with the Saudis. They can threaten and scold players to not join the rebel organization, but can you really do anything if players already rescinded their memberships? And the only thing they could do, the PGA Tour banned everyone who defected. They'll no longer be eligible for the President's Cup or the FedEx Cup, but the money is what they're after, not the accolades. But money itself comes with a price. You have to work with the closest thing to the devil in human form. Phil Mickelson mentioned it in a conversation in his autobiography. They're scary motherfuckers to get involved with. We know they killed Kasagi and have a horrible record on human rights. They execute people over there for being gay. Knowing all of this, why would I even consider it? Because this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reshape how the PGA Tour operates. Nobody actually wants to work with Saudi Arabia, but it's for other reasons. The money they offer isn't only tantalizing, but to change the sport itself. Many golfers see the PGA Tour as not only antiquated, but outright corrupt. They see live as a way to push the sport into the 21st century. It's a way to break the PGA's monopoly. Or maybe it's due to Phil's noted gambling debts. However, once again, you have to deal with Saudi Arabia. They're one of the most brutal dictatorships in the world, but maybe they've changed. Look at what Greg Norman said about them. We've all made mistakes. People can reform from killing journalists and political opponents. Sheiks aren't all bad, right? It's the ultimate question of ethics. Do you take the money you could quite possibly never see in your lifetime, or are you so disgusted with the Saudis you want nothing to do with them? What if Saudi Arabia gets bored of it and the venture falls through? What if the PGA's banned then? Future is unknown, but right now the money flows. Everything Live Golf does follows the Ted DiBiase principle. Everybody's got a price. With how many golfers have taken the bait and pledged their services to live, it further proves the main thing that talks is cold hard cash. Money is the ultimate privilege in this world. If you're loaded, you can get away with a lot of shit. You can influence and even change lawmaking in countries. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, you can cover entire swaths of human rights abuses under the banner of elite sport. All the while major countries overlook such bullshit because of it. What we're seeing on the 18 holes of battle are tensions aplenty. Rory McIlroy won the RBC Canadian Open and made a jab at having more wins than Greg Norman did. Shit-flinging and accusations on both sides of the aisle. It's even more awkward in this US Open since the PGA Tour has no jurisdiction in the major tourneys. So those that flock to Sheik Midas' gold depository are allowed to play in it. With every swing, it's not about the greatness of the sport. It's about the great chasm that's opened up over the past few months. It'll be even more ironic if a defector to live ends up winning the tournament outright will show that the Cold War is more than brewing. It's featuring outright hostility. And the stalemate is merely beginning. Buckle up. If Vladimir Putin had a, a tournament, would, would you play there? That's speculation. I'm can't, not even going to comment on speculation. So, just, just in a generality, is there any way you wouldn't play on a moral basis? If the money was right, is there any way you wouldn't play? I, d I don't need to answer that question. Sorry? I don't need to answer that question. Lee, do you want to answer it? Would you, I mean, would you have played in apartheid South Africa, for example? Well, you're just asking us to answer a hypothetical question there, which... Well, they're you know, moral we questions, answer, aren't they? Answer a question on that.